I'm Leila Halal, Director of the International Affairs Forum. Thank you all for joining us tonight to launch our 26th season. Tonight's event follows on a spectacularly successful 25th anniversary season under the leadership of Karen and Jack Siegel and the IAF Advisory Board, so thank you. As IAF embarks on the next quarter century of programming, I extend a sincere and heartfelt thanks to all of IAF's patron members and members for your support. Your generosity makes this local to global enterprise possible. On behalf of the IAF board and NMC, we are dedicated to continuing to bring you the high quality programming that you have come to expect from IAF. We look forward to hearing from you and working in partnership with many of you as we aim to deepen our impact in the next 25 years. I would also like to thank NMC colleagues, IAF volunteers, including our newly constituted IAF student leadership team, and most particularly Sue Wersbecki, for all of your invaluable time and effort this would not happen tonight without you. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to the World Cultures class and Jim Bensley, faculty at NMC and IAF board member. We have a particularly strong student turnout tonight um, and I thank you for your interest and engagement. Um, and I also, um, finally, and most importantly, want to recognize uh, Bill and Kathy Steves. Um, do you want to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> it is because of you that we have Ambassador Atala with us tonight, and um, I really enjoyed and just the pleasure of working with you and look for to continuing our work together. Um, tonight, we are very delighted to be able to welcome Tunisian Ambassador Hatta Matala to IAF. Ambassador Atala served in the Tunisian diplomatic corps for over 35 years. He was permanent representative of Tunisia to the African Union, the Economic Commission for Africa, and numerous UN agencies. He served as ambassador to numerous countries as well, including South Africa, Ireland, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and the US from 2000 to 2004. He was Tunisia's ambassador to the UK when the Jasmine Revolution er erupted in Tunisia in the winter of 2010. In 2012, he went back to Tunisia to serve as diplomatic advisor to the head of the Tunisian government. He then served for three years as the executive director of the Anna Lind Foundation in Egypt. Ambassador Atala's rich diplomatic history presents us with an opportunity to learn about the particular history and experience of Tunisia, unique as it is, as it transitioned from revolt to democratic practice and to reflect on US policy and engagement in the broader Middle East and North Africa. But as Karen reminded me yesterday, this is one of the few times in which IAF has had a foreign diplomat on its stage. So we have a lot to learn and to hear from about tonight. So without further ado, please, Ambassador Atala, come join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you served as Tunisian ambassador to the US, um, but your link to the United States goes back much further. Tell us your story and how your um, exposure to the United States has informed your worldview. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Please allow me, before I start, responding to the question to uh, thank the uh, International Affairs Forum 
for this invitation. Thank you, Leila, Stan, and of course, Bill and Kathy Steves for being so instrumental to uh, uh, me coming to this uh, part of the United States with my wife, Faika, in the, uh, in the audience as well, making sure that I don't go astray. Um, yes, my, my, my connection or relationship with the United States goes back to the time when after high school I applied for a one-year uh, foreign exchange uh, program. I don't know if you are familiar with the American Field Service, the AFS, uh, and they uh, brought me to next door, Wisconsin. I was uh, in a small town called Watertown, halfway between Milwaukee and Madison. It was, uh, for me, it was a really a unique experience because coming from Tunisia, as you know, majority Muslim country, my year in Wisconsin, uh, I spent it with a Lutheran reverend, reverend family. It was for me an extraordinary experience, really extraordinary experience, and I do recall uh, vividly the long evenings I spent with uh, Reverend Christensen, my American father, uh, discussing a variety of issues, variety of issues, and he was uh, as curious about uh, Islam as I was about uh, the Lutheran faith. Um, but then I returned to Tunis and I joined the uh, Foreign Service, back in 1979. Uh, three years later, uh, 1983, the foreign minister told me that uh, we have decided to establish a congressional relations service at the embassy of Tunisia, and he would like me to take that uh, position. I arrived in Washington in 1983 and served until 1990 as the congressional relations officer for the embassy, uh, basically spending all my days and uh, nights and weekends on Capitol Hill, uh, uh, trying to understand, but also trying to explain, pre present Tunisia's message to, uh, to the Congress. Um, I then uh, returned to Tunis, uh, and I was, uh, after three years, I was appointed ambassador to South Africa. I was the first ambassador of Tunisia uh, to South Africa, uh, opening uh, the embassy immediately after the uh, election of Nelson Mandela as president. So for us, it was an extraordinary opportunity, really, to, to get into uh, that position. And that also was an extraordinary experience uh, to be in South Africa in that period of, of time um, with Nelson Mandela, Thabo Mbeki, Frederick de Klerk, all those really, um, I mean, uh, people who have shaped the history of, uh, of South Africa. Um, my third ambassador, uh, ambassadorship was in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I'm sorry, my second ambassadorship was back to the United States. Yeah, Washington, 2000, 2004. Um, yes, and uh, it was uh, by way of uh, uh, a Different joke. Different from Wisconsin. Sorry? Different from Wisconsin. It was different from Wisconsin, definitely. I came in September, and I uh, presented my letters in October, so it was still President Clinton, the White House. So I presented my letters to President Clinton. And as I was waiting, uh, I was in the cabinet room. I had to sign the book. One of the, uh, one of the president's advisors came over, said, congratulations, Ambassador. We're pleased to have you. And then he looked at me and he said, you were in this country until 1990. You served from 83 to 90. And you left under a bush. And now you're coming back with elections within a month, and uh, a bush is running. Is there something you know we don't? <laughs> um, 
I said, please don't get me involved in this. I have not even started my mission here. Um, yeah, so uh, after Washington, I uh, went back to Tunis again, and my third assignment was Ethiopia, where I served as the permanent representative of Tunisia to the African Union, to the Economic Commission for Africa. But also, I was ambassador to several other countries in the, in, uh, in the region, to Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, the Comoros, the Seychelles, uh, a variety of, uh, of issues, uh, but also as permanent representative to the African Union, we had a chance to uh, really travel across Africa for a variety of issues as they come up or as they brought to the African Union uh, attention. I uh, then was uh, transferred to London, to the court of St. James, uh, where in a span of two and a half years, we really had a full schedule with uh, a uh, royal jubilee, a royal wedding, and the Olympics. So uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was not as restful as we thought it would be. Uh, but it was really an extraordinary experience as well, um, you know, from a different perspective. So that's in a nutshell what I did before joining the, for the Prime Minister's office and served as his uh, diplomatic advi uh, advisor. What a tour. We, and we look forward to reading your book, <laughs> <laughs> your memoir. Um, but let's, let us turn to Tunisia. And, and my opening question may seem strange to some people, but... It makes sense to me. Um, is Tunisia part of Africa, the Middle East, or Europe? Hmm. And, and we have here yeah. a, a partial map. So answer it as you see fit, please. Well, I mean, uh, uh, geographically, Tunisia is, of course, in Northern Africa. But if you look at that position, uh, it has made the country crossroads from east to west, and uh, vice versa, north, south, and south, north. Basically, we have been at the crossroads of a variety of civilizations, which has made us, yes, we are African, as I said, but also made us part of the whole entire uh, uh, area of the Mediterranean. So, we may say that we belong to the, uh, the African continent, definitely. We belong to the Arab world, yes, but we are certainly also Mediterranean um, with uh, a lot of deep roots and cultural uh, connections with the uh, European, uh, European continent. Um, so, uh, a, uh, a former Tunisian uh, foreign minister used to say that Tunisia is the mama, um, Mediterranean, Arab, Muslim, and African. So. And, and why should Americans care about Tunisia? Why should America care about Tunisia? I think, um, I'm sure that some of, the, uh, some of you probably have looked and searched Tunisia's American relations and have found out that the first treaty signed between Tunisia and the United States goes back to 1797. It was a treaty called Treaty of Peace and Friendship. It was signed by the Bay of Tunis, the King of Tunis, whereby the Tunisian Navy would provide protection for American merchant vessels uh, crossing the Mediterranean. Then our uh, first envoy uh, came to the United States in 1805. That was the first embassy of Tunisia to Washington. In, 19, in 1865, I'm sorry, the Bay of Tunis also sent a delegation to the, uh, to the United States to, uh, to congratulate uh, the, uh, the American people uh, for the uh, end of the Civil War. 
And if you, some of you from the State Department, go to the seventh floor in the portraits gallery, you will see, you will see a portrait of the Bay of Tunis who was presented as a gift to the, to the people of the United States or for, on that occasion. So it's a long, really, it's a long history. The United States also, uh, uh, Tunisia was the second country to recognize the independence of the United States. And the United States reciprocated by being the first country to recognize the independence of Tunisia. So it's really a long history of friendship, of cooperation. The uh, USAID was extremely uh, present in the country in the first years of independence. Uh, the Peace Corps was there. I mentioned my own personal story uh, with the American Field Service and the foreign exchange programs. So, uh, I mean, there is a very solid base for this uh, relationship. And I think with time and different circumstances, uh, this relationship has uh, developed. The United States also has been extremely helpful when it comes to the security of Tunisia, um, providing assistance in terms of training, in terms of equipment, uh, in terms of intelligence. Uh, so there is a very, very strong basis for the cooperation. And I think what we are doing is only perpetuating this tradition of, uh, of uh, uh, friendship between the two countries. Um, and I would note that um, the, uh, there is a strategic alliance to be made between Tunisia and the United States. Tunisia is the only Arab Muslim majority country that is ranked as free by Freedom House. Um, yes, indeed. It's, it's something to reflect on. Um, so let us turn then to um, the past eight years and um, the so-called Arab Spring. I mean, Tunisia has been described, including by me, as one of the success stories of, this, of the so-called Arab Spring. Um, and I think that the 2019 protest movements in Algeria and Sudan may challenge um, this claim of, of um, the only success story, but um, we can discuss that a bit later. And for now, I, I wanted to have you tell us how Tunisia went from dictatorship to a new democracy. That's a very interesting question. In five minutes. <laughs> okay, that's a really, really interesting question. And I, if, if you allow me, I'm going to try to answer it in three different stages. The why, the how, and the what next. The why is that because um, it happened after a long period of accumulation of difficulties, of frustrations, of economic hardships for the lower classes of, of the people. Um, for 23 years under the, uh, the uh, presidency of President uh, Zine al Abidin Ben Ali, who, by the way, uh, has passed away today, um, the people of Tunisia, particularly the poorer classes, really suffered a great deal. And uh, it is not only the economic uh, suffering, what is the worst for a human being or for a person is when you lose hope, when you do not have a clear prospect for your future, of the future of your children. That's the worst part. And that has accumulated over the years under the presidency of Zin Abidin Ben Ali to a point where the uh, particularly youth in the country got to the position of, I have nothing to lose because there is no hope for me and there is nothing I can do or can expect to be able to do in this current situation. And that feeling led Mohammed al-Bouazizi to um, burn himself to death because he was not allowed to sell 
his fruits or vegetables on the street. And that happened in December 2010? That has December, uh, 17th of December 2010, correct. Uh, then the response of the authority was very repressive. Um, and that has created a big reaction from the population and the movement started to spread to other cities and to other places. Uh, first of all, we, I mean, they, the authorities thought that it will be contained within this area of the northwest of the country, but then it spread all over. It went all the way to the coastal uh, cities. Then, at the end of December, uh, I think uh, the, the, the um, um, as you'd say, the Rubicon was crossed. The, uh, the, the uh, security forces started shooting, and the first victims fell. And I think that was really the turning point that people became so adamant, so determined that, you know, if uh, you start seeing people die, then there is no point in stepping back. Anyway, until the 13th of January, when uh, the president asked the military to, to, uh, to, to open fire uh, because he thought that the police was not efficient. So he asked the military to do it. The response was no. We will not shoot because our role is to protect the country, to protect the borders, and not to shoot on, to, on citizens. So if those are the orders, then we are pulling back to our barracks, and the army pulled back from the streets, went back to the barracks. The next day, the 14th, the president under the pressure from the street left the country. He left the country and went to Saudi Arabia. What I said, he, uh, we heard the, the news today that he has died in a hospital in Jeddah. Um, so this is, if you want, the why. The how, the movement was entirely spontaneous. It was not organized by any political party or any other structured organization. It was totally spontaneous. Two, it was leaderless. No one was leading the, the protesters. No one would be speaking on behalf of the protesters. It was a, just a massive movement. Three, it was entirely led and organized by youth. Entirely. If you go and through Google and look at the pictures, some of the pictures of those days, you will only see young people, young men and young women, doing uh, uh, all the, I mean, going uh, 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 through the streets of Tunis. It was also a movement that has basically transformed uh, uh, the way you organize a protest because it was based on Facebook and Twitter. That's how it was conducted by youth. And of course, that was not, I mean, the, the security forces were not able to control anything. So that's the how. Now, the what, what next? Then, immediately after uh, uh, the 14th, political parties and political figures of the opposition started to come into play. And the, if you want, the new picture started to emerge. There were still protests, and people started asking for the transformation of the political system in the country. Um, that protest took about another three to four months where people were adamant on changing the form of the regime and removed from the presidential regime, people were asking for a parliamentarian regime. And of course, um, that had, uh, of course, that, I mean, that demand would entail a new constitution, which we decided 
to, uh, to, uh, to prepare. Uh, from March to October, we had a transitional government led by a prime minister who later on in 2014 became president of the country. Until October of that year, uh, 2011, where we had elections for the uh, Constitutional Assembly. Uh, the Constitutional Assembly was supposed to be there for one year to, to uh, draft the uh, Constitution, but it took three years to do that. Finally, the, uh, the text was adopted, but it was not easy. It was not easy because we went through a lot of difficulties in the process. In February 13, we had, unfortunately, our first political assassination. A leader of a, uh, a party was, uh, was killed in the capital. And that has created a lot of tension, a lot of uh, uh, turmoil. And then in, uh, on uh, July 25th, we had the second one, second uh, uh, political uh, assassination. But also in parallel, as I said, we were drafting the Constitution. And some of the articles presented uh, were highly controversial, and I should say totally rejected by the population. Uh, the most important or uh, 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 two articles were the first one that would uh, write in the Constitution that Islam is the religion of the state. That was rejected. And we reverted back to the first article of the old Constitution, which uh, uh, puts the religion as one of the characteristics of the country, of the state. The second one was about the position of women in society, and the proposal was to make women or consider women as complementary to men. That was rejected, and the strong movement went into play um, from, I would say, July until November. On a daily basis, 24 hour a day, the movement, there was a sit-in in front of parliament, uh, with a variety, I mean, all classes and all uh, ages uh, participated, men, women. On the 13th of August, which is Women's Day for Tunisia, now that goes back to the time when I mentioned the, the, uh, the emancipation of women. Um, on the 13th of August, there was an enormous demonstration in Tunis, and that, as I said, led to the establishment of a, uh, a national dialogue group, and that ended the, uh, that government's rule, and the new government was, uh, uh, was chosen, ran the country for a year until uh, October 2014, where we had the first general parliamentary and presidential elections, uh, which saw President uh, Beji Qaid Sebsi become president. This was the gentleman I said, prime minister, then became president, and who, who unfortunately, on the 25th of July, past July, has passed away. And this is for his replacement that we are having elections during this period of time, and we can come back to the elections if you want at a later stage. So this is what next. The country now is, re is building itself as a uh, emerging, if you want, democracy. We are at really just the threshold, the beginning, the very early preliminary stages. We know that the road is going to be long, uh, bumpy. Uh, so we're looking at countries with um, longer experience. We're looking at countries that can uh, 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 present us with solutions to the problems that we uh, will be facing. And we know that we will be facing problems, particularly economically 
And if you want, we can go back to that uh, later on, uh, Leila. Yes. Um, so you're describing um, that a Tunisia that is very secular-minded, um, uh, very sort of cosmopolitan in terms of how it um, sees the the place of women, or maybe it's contested, but there is a there is a secular history to Tunisia and a secular nature. Um, on the other hand, um, the, the most foreign fighters that went to fight with ISIS in Syria and Iraq, the most foreign fighters came from, I think, Jordan, and then Tunisia was the second highest country um, that didn't send, but from which foreign fighters went to ISIS to fight. Um, how, do you, how do you explain that, that gap and... And in, in how is Tunisia contending with um, foreign fighters trying to come back now? Yes, true. And uh, it is one of, the, uh, one of those uh, uh, challenging issues to, uh, to try to uh, explain. But I think I, I have touched a little bit on uh, the reasons when I said that youth in Tunisia at one point reached the stage where they felt they have nothing to lose. For them whether they die today or tomorrow, it wouldn't matter because they really had no hope for the future. But then also again, uh, uh, if you do recall in those early years, I would say, of uh, um, or the last part of the previous uh, decade, um, the movement, there was a very big uh, movement, particularly through satellite televisions that was conveying, um, uh, uh, I mean, a message uh, for the, um, uh, the revival of the Umab, which is the Muslim nation, based on the notion of the jihad. But unfortunately, a lot of youth fell into that trap. Uh, they fell into that trap, as I said, because they really had no future prospects for themselves, but also they fell into the trap because the educational system did not prepare them to challenge those ideas. And we can go back to the educational system if you want to. They were not really prepared to challenge that. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, when somebody comes and offers them the possibility of earning uh, uh, $3,000 a month uh, joining this, uh, uh, this movement and at the same time uh, fulfilling one of their duties towards the religion. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do fall into that trap. Um, but what I'm trying to, 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 to say here is that it is something that we need to look into, and to me the solution is not to try to deconstruct the message, but not let the message get to, to youth. We have to work at the, the earlier stages, and this is why I'm, I'm saying that the education system is something that needs to be uh, looked at. The second point that I would like to make here is that um, I strongly believe that facing these arguments, the best counter-argument would have to rest on cultural dimensions. As long as you're comfortable with your own culture, you know who you are, you know your identity, you, have, you stand a much better chance to, uh, uh, to counter that argumentation than if you uh, were not. And three, I would say that in this, in this context, youth must lead. They know how to speak to other youth. They know how to uh, uh, get a reaction. Our society is not the same as the society that youth will live in that youth will create for themselves. And I think this, that society needs to be given 
the tools, but also the opportunity to establish itself according to their own vision, what they want to do in the future. It is impossible for us to face a phenomenon that belongs to the 21st century by referring or reverting to solutions and arguments that belong to the 20th century. And this is why I believe that youth really must have, must take the leading role here. Now, what do we do with those returning? We are not, uh, uh, we are not bringing them back. And all those who do return to the country, uh, they are arrested and they uh, are tried for what they have done. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, in, in um, eastern Syria and in Iraq, there are thousands and thousands of ISIS, yes. suspected ISIS or accused ISIS members. Um, there are so many that, that um, the authorities in these countries are executing, summarily yes. executing many. So I think um, the question of what to do with fighters or people who are accused of fighting is, is, a, is, a, is a big challenge. And, and, and we hope Tunisia um, takes it on in such a thoughtful way as, as you're proposing. Um, if I may hear, really, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's a, it's a very vast subject that we can debate and we can discuss um, uh, uh, at length. But why, what I, I believe that these groups, they always follow the weak spots. That's what they're looking for. They cannot take on a strong uh, state or a, a strong... Um, society. They always look for those who have to present, who present weaknesses, and they use that. So the solution is really to work on the structures to make sure that the citizens become part of the system, that the citizens really are, feel that they have that responsibility of protecting, of strengthening the structures of the state, because at the end of the day, they would, be the bene the, they would benefit from that or they will be the victims. So it's, it's not only a question, yes, of course, you have to have security forces, you have to have a strategy, you have to have the equipment, you have to have the, 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 the firepower to, to fight them, but I think the most solid uh, uh, protection is society itself. If you have a vibrant civil society, if you have a very committed uh, uh, society, people who feel that they are true citizens and that this state belongs to them, they will defend it. And so the Tunisian elections resulted in um, the, the wins or the, the, those that the two candidates that won and that will face a runoff are anti-establishment populist figures, um, something similar to what we see throughout um, the US, Western Europe, throughout the world, really. So is there, di is there a large disaffection as a result of um, the uprising and, and, and sort of the slowness of the transition? Um, what do you attribute the, the election outcome to? Yes. Um, before I come to, to the results of the uh, elections and what you said is, is right about the, uh, the, the two uh, contenders, um, I, I would like to go back to what I said earlier, that the movement was led and organized by youth. So, and I also said that after that, political parties and political figures started coming into play. The first uh, government we had, um, the uh, average age was 60. The, uh, You're talking the, about the 20, uh, 
11, 2012? Yes. Constituent yes. Assembly. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, that continued, that trend continued. And youth in recent years really, I mean, felt that they were not represented in the new political dispensation. They led the, the revolution and they got nothing. Only the political parties who did not take part in the movement were taking all the uh, uh, positions in the government and in the other structures. I mean, uh, there was a lot of dissatisfaction. And we have seen last year in the, in the local elections that youth did not participate. It was very, very low youth participation. But unfortunately, the message was not heard. And when we had the first round of the presidential election this year, um, first of all, participation was about 45%. And it was very, very, very low when it comes to youth participation. So prior participation rate was 64, now down to 45. Yes, 64 to 95, uh, to 45 now. So, and the reason I think here is that youth now have lost, uh, if you want, trust in the leadership that they see. Whether it was, um, I mean, whether these people were in government or in opposition. Everyone that has served in one way or another in any structure, governmental or generally political, was pushed aside. The two people who, I mean, among the, 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 uh, among the candidates, we had three former prime ministers and one former president. And they all lost. The two who have come first and second have no political party. One of them created a party two months before the elections. Um, one is a professor. He, had, he ran no campaign, had no campaign team, ran no ads, spoke to no uh, uh, press channel, nothing. And he was elected first. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it really, it challenged the, 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 the entire system. The second one was, I mean, still is the head of a television channel. He's a businessman. Um, he ran his campaign on uh, distributing aid and assistance to the poor segments of the population. That was his campaign. And he has a lot of problem with justice. And as a matter of fact, some of you probably know that he is currently now, as we speak, he's in jail. <laughs> and he now will be running for president in the second round. So, the, the, the message was, to me, the message was very clear. We do not want anyone that has anything to do with the system or with the political structures. The message wanted to see that the entire uh, 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 process be reviewed and maybe revisited, corrected with different uh, figures, different uh, uh, personalities. That is one. Two, I think it's a general movement across Europe. You see all the populists really gagging around everywhere. Uh, I mean, in large uh, segments of particularly Europe, uh, but also in, uh, in South America. This is a phenomenon that is really uh, expanding. So. I'm not surprised, given the very close relations that Tunisia and Tunisian population has with Europe that could be part of that general uh, uh, new uh, movement. But I think 
the most important, I would say, uh, message is that they are signaling, I mean, youth is signaling, and the population of Tunisia in general, or at least those who have voted, are signaling the fact that they are dissatisfied. And I think uh, uh, it is a clear signal. We have to heed that call. We have to correct what needs to be corrected. But on the positive side, we're very happy that this strong message came through the polls and not through violence on the streets. And this is why we still feel that Tunisia is on the right track, that despite the difficulties that, you know, and we know that there are more coming our way, that uh, we are on the right path. Okay. I'm going to ask you um, just about Libya. Um, before we open okay. it up to questions, um, Libya uh, was, was a big issue in the United States. Um, the United States intervened uh, with other countries to um, save Benghazi from a massacre and to end Gaddafi's rule. This created a power vacuum that was filled by militants. Um, mm -hmm. Then we saw the killing of U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens. Um, and to this day, Libya is in a deep uh, struggle for power between competing um, groups. So was the U.S. wrong to intervene in Libya? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, and I'm not here, I'm not playing, you know, the diplomatic uh, game of uh, creating a, uh, a nuance, whatever, but uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the intervention in, in Libya was primarily conducted by France and Great Britain. And I think the United States did not intervene directly in the conflict because there was no resolution, no UN resolution to allow for this until until the Arab League asked. And I think that has changed the whole configuration. Um, I think also uh, uh, the, the, uh, the situation of Libya was, and still is, uh, extremely complicated. Because when the, when, if you want, the, the, the uprising started, they, in fact, they were after one man who symbolized and who personified, in fact, the whole uh, uh, state of the Jamahiri, as it used to be called. I'm saying this because, in reality, there was no state structure in Libya. Everything was based on, you know, uh, loose committees, popular committees, but everything goes back to uh, Gaddafi. Plus, Libya has always had a tribal organization. The most important component in Libya and in the uh, uh, running Libya were the tribes. So, um, the, 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 any intervention would have to decide after the fall of Gaddafi what to do. And I think nobody thought about that. And this is the result that we see. Particularly today when Libya became the theater of a confrontation of forces that are outside of Libya. You have forces that are being, some are being uh, 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 supported and armed by uh, by the United Arab Emirates and the other side by Qatar, I mean, for just to, to name those two. And they are fighting in Libya. So it's not, it's not really the fact that we are looking at uh, 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 Libya as a, uh, a place where there was a right or wrong uh, 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 intervention. I think the, the Libyan people deserve 
to have a democratic state, to have a state that functions. But today, there is unfortunately no sign that we're getting closer to that. As a matter of fact, we have today two governments in Libya. And depending on who you talk to, you get a version of the facts. And uh, in my own opinion, as long as the three major elements of weapons, money, and fighters do exist in Libya, there will be no end to the, to the, to the uh, fighting. And money there is plenty. And weapons there is even more. Uh, weapons, they, they are numbered by the millions uh, in, in Libya. But let me take a little bit further your question and your uh, Libya issue to say that that has direct impact on us, on Tunisia. So our security forces are really stretched very thin that because they have to protect the borders and uh, as you can see on the, on the map, we have a very, very long uh, border with Libya and it's all desert. Very complicated, very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to, to man. But also at the same time, on the western, northwestern side of Tunisia, on the Algerian border, our security forces are also fighting pockets of jihadists and extremists and terrorists uh, there. So, uh, and to start with, Tunisia never had a big army. We never believed in that. I mean, the policy of our first president, President Bourguiba, was that it is better to build a school uh, uh, a classroom than to buy a tank. So, uh, so we still uh, feel the same. <laughs> okay. uh, we'll, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, we have two student volunteers running mics. You have one there. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing through these gl uh, there glaring There is one. Yeah, we have one here. Okay. I'd like to know if you have uh, suggestions, given the uh, aggressiveness of the youth to take responsibility for the revolution to begin with, and yet they seem to be powerless or not motivated to go further with this. How do you develop the youth leadership and motivation to step into the role of leadership and uh, develop the resources for them to take more responsibility for the government? Do you have suggestions for that? Thank you. Um, should I answer directly? Or we can take a couple of questions. Okay. Do you prefer? It's okay. It's okay. Uh, I'll that, just, that's uh, not a tradition that they follow, that we follow here. So go ahead and answer the question. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I think the best way is to uh, allow youth inside the boardroom um, so that they take part into the discussion and into the decision making process. They basically, what you do is empower them that youth take full responsibility of the measures that will be implemented. What I mean also is that when you have a population, Tunisia is 60% under 30. Some other countries in the region are 70% under 30. And then you talk to the leaders there and they try to explain to you that they have a youth policy. Now, a policy, a restricted or a, uh, 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 a policy specific to 70% of the population. So when you have a, pop, uh, a population 
of that type of uh, 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 structure. It's not a youth po policy that you establish. It's a policy. And youth today, I think, feel that they still are kept outside the boardroom waiting for someone to come out and tell them this is, these are the decisions that we have taken. I think, I think it is time really, and I believe strongly about this, that uh, they have to take responsibility. Um, of course, uh, I always give the figure of, or the, the, uh, the example of a, a, uh, a driver's uh, a learner. Uh, how do you call that? Uh, a driver's school, whatever. Yeah, you have the, the, the student who is learning. He is the one driving. The instructor is next to him, making sure that he doesn't make a fatal mistake. But it is the student driving. I think it is, I believe it is time to give them the wheel. And uh, also, it is, uh, I believe, personally, I, I believe it is only normal because they are preparing for the society in which they will live. It's their society. So they have to be part of uh, uh, the, the organization of that society. Uh, so my answer is give them more room, involve them, allow them to take responsibility, be there just for them to... Uh, to, to basically make sure that they don't, well, that's it. Yeah, exactly. And jobs. <laughs> yes, in the middle there. Can you wave in the mic? Oh. oh. I can't think of a, is this working? No, no. No. Oh. Nice. Um, I'll just run up there. <clears throat> Down here in the front, where's the other mic? They're both not working. Uh, both, both mics are not they're working. They're both off, yeah. okay. Well, yes. try and shout loudly. Please. Yes. Stand up, please. Go ahead. You said they don't so, so, have a central bank? So the question is, um, the countries that are in deep conflict, Libya, yes. Syria, some other countries, don't have a central bank. Is there a link between conflict and lack of central well, bank? Well, act actually, there is a central bank in Libya. There is a central bank in Libya. Um, and that is, I mean, surprisingly, of course, it can be explained, uh, the only structure that uh, never, was never part of the conflict. Uh, in Libya, the central bank uh, exists and it is operating. The, uh, the, in fact, if you, uh, I mean, analyze the conflict from the beginning to end, only few moments or few events took place around the oil fields. The oil production and the central bank are the only two that everybody agrees not to touch. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, well, first of all, if you take uh, Syria, I think before they get into the central or the global, if you want, uh, yeah, uh, banking system, I think there is already a problem for the banking system in Syria. It has to be developed, it has to be brought up to, uh, to standards 
before they can enter into the world, uh, uh, the, the, the world, uh, uh, I mean, economic and financial uh, uh, structures. The uh, same thing, yeah, uh, I believe with, I think you mentioned Yemen or not, but Yemen is also uh, another example. Uh, for Iraq, it was destroyed, and I think it is, uh, it needs to be rebuilt. Uh, so, um, in, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, Libya, again, as I was talking about a little bit earlier about the general structure of the state, the, the Libyan financial organization or banking needs to be uh, reconstructed. Totally. I don't know if I answered your question or not. So, Maybe uh, not. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, take a question over here. Are the mics working? Well, I guess... Right. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Sir, I think you are probably the best person maybe in the world to answer my question. Okay. <laughs> What a responsibility. <laughs> Before the Arab Spring, there was an old canard that said that the Arabs are not capable of democratic rule, that the Arab world is unlike the rest of the world, and somehow or other, uh, ideologically or culturally, Arabs are not constitutionally able to uh, run democracies. And then came along the Arab Spring, and that changed everything. I was in Cairo at the time, and people were so excited about the coming of freedom and democracy. Then it sort of faded away in the last 10 years. Uh, is there anything about Arab culture that makes it difficult for the people to succeed in democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me start by saying that I personally believe that um, we need to talk about Tunisia Spring, not Arab Spring. I say this because each country is different. Each country is different. What happened in Tunisia happened because of the reality of Tunisia. The way the process was conducted and emerged has a lot to do with the history, the culture, the reality, and the social accumulations throughout a long period of time in Tunisia. But that is different from what happened in Egypt different from what happened in Syria, and the differences are because of those different accumulations and those different realities on the ground. If I may just, just by way of single little example, just to give you an idea about what I mean with a different reality and the different, if you want, even social uh, uh, structure. Tunisia is the only Arab country where polygamy is prohibited. Tunisia is the only country in the Arab Muslim world where a Muslim woman can marry a non-Muslim without obliging that person to convert to Islam. So it's a different reality, totally different reality from one country to another. So, I will answer by saying that the Tunisia Spring happened because I was talking about the why a little bit earlier, because of those realities. Um, if, I, if, if you do recall, when I mentioned the reaction of the military on the 13th of January, when they were ordered to open fire, they said no and went back to their barracks. It is because the military in Tunisia never, never had a role in the political arena. Now, I cannot say the same for Egypt. I cannot say the same for Iraq or for Syria or for other countries. 
They have a different reality. They have a different, uh, 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 even I would say they have a different vision of, uh, uh, of the country. Now, also, what I would like to add is that um, the, the way the Tunisian society uh, uh, behaves or responds to uh, situations, Tunisian society is very resilient. Um, throughout our history, um, if you, even if, without going back to the times of Carthage and whatever, during the War of Independence from France, if you compare what happened or the way independence was gained by Tunisians as to what happened in Algeria, you already see the difference. Our independence, except for maybe three to four years of fighting, was uh, 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 achieved through discussion and negotiations. Um, of course, leadership was there and conducted the whole thing. In Algeria, it was an all-out war. Uh, so the, the realities and the social structures differ from uh, uh, one country to another. And I agree with you when you said that uh, I have always had difficulties with people saying, I mean previously, that uh, democracy cannot, uh, uh, cannot fit with the uh, uh, Arab world. Um, but if I do not accept that because we are all human beings and human beings all react the same when it is a question of their freedoms and their humanity. Saying that, I'm also aware of the fact that fitting democracy in a society in the Arab world is extremely difficult. And let me explain to you why. Tunisian, I mean, uh, Arab societies, including Tunisia, Arab societies are group-based. In a democracy, it's the individual that becomes really the source of the initiative, the one who conducts the initiative, and at the end of the day, he is the beneficiary of that initiative with other individuals. For in our societies, it's the group, it's not the individual. So we have to change our frame of mind to move from a group-based society to an individual-based society so that the individual understands that he has a responsibility, he has a role, but also he, that he is important. And that I would take a jump to another situation whereby he would understand that his vote counts. So that, that is one of the difficulties that we are facing. The, the why we did not face that uh, situation in Tunisia, uh, like other countries have uh, faced, I think it is because we have a very, very strong civil society, extremely vigilant, extremely aware, and extremely active civil society. By just way of uh, uh, example, let me remind you that in 2014, it was, it was the Nobel Peace Prize was given to four organizations in Tunisia, civil society, for the political dialogue that they conducted to solve the political problem that, was, that followed the uh, political assassination I was talking about a little earlier. The four were the trade union, the employers union, the order of, uh, of lawyers, and the Tunisian hum uh, uh, Human Rights League. 2014, they were they won the, the Nobel Peace Prize for their, for their work. It is a recognition for the role of civil society in general, of course, but of Tunisia for its role. So again, what I'm saying here is that uh, 
the reality is different. So I think when you said that, unfortunately, this Arab Spring has failed and has maybe turned into an Arab winter, I think uh, in, in Tunisia it's still an Arab Spring. It is still a Tunisian Spring. And I strongly believe that, yes, we are going to face enormous difficulties, particularly economic, and we have not talked about that yet, uh, enormous economic difficulties, but we, we believe that uh, this is the right path. This is the right path. Does someone want to talk, ask a question about economics? Oh. <laughs> uh, let we me have, ask. If, can we have if, a student question? I'm can we sorry, have a student sorry. question in the back? There is a question. There yeah, we have there. students in the back here. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I guess my question is, is that as, I guess, a young person, sometimes I feel very overwhelmed with all the problems in the world, such as climate change, as well as a lot of the governmental issues. Um, and sometimes, too, I feel like, I guess that, like, people think that I'm, like, too young to worry about these things, and, like, oh, why do you care? You'll be okay. You'll survive. And I just feel like... I'm not sure how to really get started. I really want to make change, and I really want to do things um, to help kind of better the world, but I'm not sure how to get started. And I guess I was just kind of wondering, like, what your suggestion would be and, like, how you would, um, like, what you would recommend for a young person like me to kind of get started. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. How did you get started? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, when I was a little bit speaking about uh, the importance of giving youth um, a role and trusting them, I'm sorry, but, you know, I revert back to my own experience. When I, uh, when I returned home from Washington in 1990, I was a young diplomat. Uh, and in Tunisia, at that time, there was change of uh, a foreign minister. A new one was appointed. And the new foreign minister appointed me as his chief of staff. I was 34 years old. And to this day, I was and still am the youngest diplomat to have taken that position. And I say this because I believe that that foreign minister allowed me to, first of all, learn, but also take my responsibilities in the decisions that I make. So what I'm saying is that we have to open the opportunity. But then it's up to you what to do with that. It is your personality, it is your ambition, it is your vision, and it is capacity to, 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 to perform. That will make the difference. Um, on the other hand, I applied to, for a promotion in the foreign ministry to move from what we call in our hierarchy minister uh, uh, plenipotentiary to, uh, if you want, minister, plenipotentiary, uh, special grade. When I applied for that, I was not uh, taken. When I asked why, they said, you're too young. I was 50. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to persevere. <laughs> you absolutely have to persevere, and I, if I have if I allow myself to give you uh, just one, one advice, never, never take anything for granted. Never. Trust and verify. <laughs> take two more questions. We have one down here in the... Uh, Jack, please. Uh, and then we'll come to the front here. Just first for the, to comment on the previous question, uh, there'll be a global 
demonstration tomorrow about the global environment uh, led by a 16-year-old. So that's a, a start. Um, I would like to ask about the role of the United States. If you look at the map behind you, the United States has been deeply involved militarily and in the support of the military in Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, at one time Iran, uh, invaded Lebanon at one point and is involved with Israel. Um, it seems though there's a disproportion between our military involvement and our political role in the region. Can you suggest how we might, uh, at, if not in the next two years, then in some future date, redirect our attention and our energy in a more effective way? Is there an international organization like the Arab Union or uh, the, inter the uh, African Union or the Arab League that the United States could engage with to be more effective in anything but building up armies? Um. First of all, I, I really would like to start by saying that we, in my own uh, evaluation of the situation as I see it today around the world, that uh, um, we are now entering a new, a new phase. There is a period of international relations which was based on a certain number of uh, rules and regulations um, which were put in place because of the reality of the world in those days, whether it is the Cold War or it is the decolonization or uh, uh, other issues. There was an international order that was put in place and we all followed the rules of that international order, particularly the, uh, the international law that comes from the United Nations uh, uh, organization. I believe that we are now changing. We are now entering a new order. The difficulty is that we still do not know its parameters. We still do not know how that order will be established. What will be the mechanisms? We are still searching. And the difficulty is that we are at the same time challenged by crises, by difficulties, but we are still applying rules and solutions from the old order which no longer apply to the new situation today, which sometimes makes the issue even more complicated. So, saying that, I believe that the United States needs to look again at the approach it is following around the world. Um, the United States is, I mean, has always held uh, an, an enormous uh, or an extraordinary position, which is moral authority. And I think that is extremely important for the United States to keep. Absolutely vital. I mean, if you look around and you see the conflicts, um, there need be, uh, w we need to have that moral authority be reinstated. Um, of course, this needs, of course, as I said, you know, a lot of thinking and a lot of elaboration, particularly when you understand at the same time that the centers of decisions, which used to be Washington, London, Paris, Moscow, uh, Tokyo, and maybe Pekin, today, uh, those centers have been multiplied by three, four times. Today, decisions that would engage a large part of humanity are taken in different places and you have different players now coming into uh, 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 the game. So the whole system needs to be looked at. 
the entire system. And I think it is extremely, I would personally believe that it would be extremely important for the United States to lead in that, uh, in that uh, 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 revision of uh, the international order based on its moral authority. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question and a brief answer. Um, I had promised the gentleman here. Please. Hi, thanks for a great talk. I had a question about the economy. Thank you. <laughs> um, most developed market economies have followed the similar model of agriculture, then some manufacturing, and then a service-based economy. But with the new global economy and all sorts of international trade, how do you see the future of uh, Tunisia's economy? Thanks for a good talk. Thank you. I think before I go into the future of the economy, I think we need to really understand the current situation, which unfortunately is not, uh, is not as good as we, we want it to be. And that's a diplomatic phrase to say that things are bad. Uh, um, after the, the, uh, the revolution, um, the governments, the succeeding governments uh, in Tunisia were all faced with enormous demands. People believe that once that man is gone, everything is going to be great. Salaries will jump 10 times, um, transportation will be free, whatever. Okay. Everyone was dreaming of something. But the main thing was that uh, demands, particularly for wage increases, were absolutely I mean, enormous, and on a daily basis. Uh, in Tunisia, we have a very, very powerful uh, trade union. Now, this trade union has been instrumental uh, throughout the various periods of the history of Tunisia. During the War of Independence, they played a central part after independence, they also played a very, very important role in the development of the country. And every time they had a very high visibility uh, when it comes to the various issues linked to the economy and the development in general. But after the, the revolution, the trade union uh, espoused the demands of the various sectors of the economy and unfortunately we entered into an endless cycle of strikes. On a daily basis you have teachers on strike, you have uh, 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 bus drivers on strike, uh, security forces went on strike. So it is really a, a, a phenomenon and the response of the government, the, all the governments that came into power after the revolution, was to, okay, you want 25% increase, you take it. And that, they thought that that would be the way to quiet things down and uh, sort of like move forward with the reforms that need to be uh, done. Unfortunately, the, the state did not have that much of money and that eventually everything was used. The second thing is that uh, the production stopped. And if you don't produce, you don't earn. And that's where the, 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 uh, the, uh, the income from the state comes from. Uh, we don't export because production has gone down. We have the, the uh, phosphate which we are one of the world major uh, phosphate producers and exporter. But phosphate has really dwindled to oh, a fraction from, I mean, we only, we only export now 20% uh, uh, of what we used to. And that is a result of this accumulation. So today we are faced with a 
a situation where we have increased our debt and uh, we're still looking for a way to restart the economy. Um, the, uh, if you want the figures uh, for 2019 are slightly better. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the economic growth, which was in 2018 about 1.8, in 2019 we're looking at 2.3, but it's still not enough. It's an increase, it's an improvement, but it's still not enough. So this is, I believe, the major challenge Tunisia faces in the what next. I think this is the major challenge. Uh, in the eight years or the seven years after uh, the revolution, uh, all the different governments forgot about the economy, but the economy did not forget them and did not forget us. And today we have to really uh, 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 take stronger, harder measures uh, to, to re, uh, restart the economic engine. Saying this, uh, we believe that, or at least we hope, with the new government coming to place, we will have a, a better, uh, or I'd say more stability in terms of uh, political uh, political uh, debates or you know differences so that we can concentrate on the economic issues uh, because that really will determine uh, the future of the country in the next five or ten years. Thank you Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We wish Tunisia all the best and we thank you for telling us your stories and for discussing with us global matters that concern us all. So thank you everyone for coming out um, and hope to see you at the next event on October 17th. Thank you. Before we conclude, oh. uh, Leila, yes. we have brought something for you for the, uh, for the uh, international, international, affairs. Uh, international, affairs. international Affairs Forum. Yes, yes. Forum. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to open it, open so uh, uh, we show it. Here it is, an olive tree. And... Uh, a symbol of peace. It's a symbol of peace, but also a symbol of longevity. It's also a symbol of longevity. As you probably know that in Tunisia, we still have olive trees uh, that date back to the Roman Empire. Thank you so much. Thank you.